I'm going to talk about a study on the change patterns of prosocial behavior among the Chinese adolescent earthquake survivors. Well, um, this study is part of a cohort study we uh, conducted after the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. Um, well, it's a very huge uh, research project. So uh, the principal investigator of the project is Professor Fan from my university. I'm uh, right now doing my postdoc research uh, with Professor Fan. Um, we uh, presented the uh, cohort study in last year's workshop. So uh, many of you may be not familiar with uh, our work, so I'm going to uh, give a brief description about what I have done, what we have uh, found. So um, as you may know, uh, the Wenchuan earthquake uh, occurred on May 12, 2008 um, in the uh, uh, Wenchuan County of Sichuan province, which is in the uh, middle west part of China. Uh, there is a ge geographic location uh, of the uh, Wenchuan County, and the earthquake is 8 magnitude. Um, it affected about uh, 15 million people, and nearly uh, 8,000 people uh, died or disappeared uh, in this earthquake. Uh, it was the deadliest earthquake since the uh, 1976 Tangshan earthquake and the strongest one since the 1915 Tibet earthquake in China. Uh, for uh, our cohort study, we uh, selected a sample from uh, Dujiang Yan City, uh, which is uh, 20 kilometers away from the epicenter, and it was uh, one of the 10 most affected areas. Um, before 2008, there was a very uh, limited research on the mental health problems um, after the natural disasters in China, especially among children and adolescents. So um, we uh, set up the, this cohort study. Uh, the major purpose was to uh, document the long-term mental health sequel of the earthquake among the adolescent survivors. Um, specifically, we are interested in um, describe the uh, uh, incidents and the longitudinal trajectories of the of some common mental health problems such as uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, or sleep problems. Um, we also uh, aim to um, uh, examine the some uh, risky factors that may be uh, related with the mental health problems. Um, the third purpose was to uh, explore some uh, genetic mechanisms underlying the development and persistence of the uh, mental disorders post earthquake. Um, and also we want to um, use some uh, neural image techniques such as uh, the H fMRI to uh, explore the uh, neurobiological mechanisms underlying the um, development and persistence of the mental disorders. Uh, about the uh, sample of the uh, cohort study, uh, so um, uh, briefly speaking, the uh, cohort study consists of three uh, sub-studies, uh, the epidemiological sub-study, the genetic uh, sub-study, and the uh, neuroimage uh, sub-study. So uh, for the um, epidemiological sub-study, uh, the sample were, were uh, 1,573 adolescents. We selected them from uh, the junior and senior high schools in Dujiang Yan City. Uh, we collected five waves of data over a period of uh, two and a half years after the earthquake. Uh, the initial survey was conducted at six months after the earthquake. Um, before this time point, we had to deal with some of the ethical, ethical proof issues. So uh, it's kind of a limitation that we could not uh, collect data immediately after the earthquake. Uh, four follow-up uh, study, uh, four follow-up surveys were um, conducted at uh, 12, 18, and 24 and 30 months after this quick. Uh, because most of the uh, pa uh, participants were high school students, and uh, after three years after this quick, they graduated from the <laughs> original schools. So it's kind of um, difficult to track them. So we only have uh, five weeks of data. And this table shows the uh, demographic characteristics and the uh, earthquake exposure of the participants. Um, we measured the earthquake exposure from four aspects. Um, the first one is uh, if you have a, a family member killed or disappearing or severely injured. Uh, the other three aspects were um, uh, uh, house damage, property loss, and uh, direct uh, witness of the, uh, some traumatic scenes. So as you can see from uh, this table, the severity of the exposure was um, kind of high. Uh, and so um, for the measurement, we uh, collect data on 
mental health problems, including PTSD, depression, anxiety, and sleep problems. And we also uh, measured uh, the earthquake-related stressors and psychosocial or familial factors that may be related with the mental health problems, uh, including the negative life events post-earthquake, uh, trait to resilience, uh, coping styles, social support, gratitude, and uh, parental bonding, uh, which is um, uh, pa parenting styles. And we also collect data on emotional, behavioral, or academic functioning. We use the strengths and difficulty questionnaire to measure five, uh, five aspects of the emotional, behavioral functioning. And we also collect data uh, for, uh, using the school, school test records to um, assess the academic functioning. Uh, well, um, our prior analysis have been uh, mainly focused on describing the prevalence and the longitudinal tra trajectories and the related factors of the mental health problems. So uh, as you can see from this table, um, uh, this shows the prevalence rates uh, on each uh, wave. Uh, <coughs> in wave two and wave four, uh, namely uh, 12 and uh, 24 months after the earthquake, the prevalence rates are um, relatively higher. So uh, we think uh, this uh, means that there might be an anniversary effect. The uh, adolescents may, be, may tend to have more uh, severe mental health problems on the days that are around the anniversary of the earthquake. So uh, I think this has a ver a very important implications for the uh, clinical uh, professionals to uh, provide more care or more clinical service on the days around the an anniversary. Um, well, uh, rather than uh, estimating the overall uh, prevalence rates, we are more interested in uh, exploring the different patterns of trajectories for the uh, mental symptoms. Because um, there is much evidence uh, indicating that um, the individual variation in people's react uh, reactions and adaptation to the earthquake is very large. Some people may, may have chronic or uh, delayed dysfunction. Some people may just fine, they, they're just very fine. So um, this has also been supported by our data. Uh, uh, this figure shows the uh, different uh, trajectory for the PTSD symptom. We found uh, five patterns. As you can see, uh, the majority of the sample, which is about 65%, uh, they showed a uh, high resilience. And they can consistently maintain uh, healthy functioning. Uh, and about 20% of the sample showed a uh, recovery they can gradually recover from the uh, PTSD symptom. And the remaining 15% um, remaining of the sample showed uh, fluctuating or delayed or chronic, dis chronic symptoms. Well, uh, similar patterns were found for the depressive, sim uh, depressive symptoms. As you can see, only one, 144 uh, subjects showed consistent uh, depressive symptoms, which, about, which is about uh, 10%. And also, uh, the similar patterns of trajectory were found for the sleep problems. Uh, as for the predictors, uh, we identified uh, several uh, common uh, predictors that uh, could be related with the chronic or uh, delayed dysfunction. Uh, such as the female gender, um, the severity of the earthquake exposure, um, negative life events, and um, less, uh, less, um, less social support, and um, the coping strategy that may be commonly related with the uh, chronic or uh, delayed dysfunction. And uh, we also uh, investigated the interrelationships be uh, among, the, among some of the uh, predictors. Uh, in this study, we um, examined the, uh, th there might be a reciprocal relation between negative life events and social support and the PTSD symptoms. So uh, the model is <laughs> kind of complicated. And we also found out that the um, uh, coping strategy um, maybe have, may have a moderating effect uh, on, in the relationship between the um, post-earthquake life events and PTSD symptoms. 
uh, specifically uh, the high level of positive coping and the low level of negative coping could mitigate the adverse effect of negative life events on PTSD symptoms. Well, uh, these are our, um, some of our prior findings. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think we have uh, talked much about the negative consequence of a, a disaster of a trauma, but actually at, at the same time, we are also very interested in um, explore the positive side of, of our disaster. Uh, a very important concept here is uh, post-traumatic growth. Uh, because it, it is widely observed that some people can achieve positive, uh, positive changes in mental and social function. Uh, for example, some may have um, higher self-efficacy, and some may have improved spirituality, and some may have closer interpersonal uh, relationships. So um, in this study, we also concerned with um, positive variable, that is the prosocial behavior. Um, for the uh, definition, uh, prosocial behavior uh, means any behavior that someone engages in that may uh, benefit another. Well, the typical types of prosocial behavior uh, include helping others, sharing, cooperating, uh, providing material or emotional support, and taking part in volunteer activities. Uh, in the literature regarding the normal development of prosocial behaviors, uh, studies have usually a uh, concern with positive variables, for example, um, positive loving parenting during childhood, uh, and uh, positive social learning experience, or uh, positive affective or cognitive factors that have been uh, proved to be related to the prosocial behavior. But in recent years, um, some scholars also uh, pointed out that exposure to uh, traumatic events could also have an enhancing effect on the sufferer's prosocial behavior. Uh, this is a phenomenon that usually labeled as uh, altruism born of suffering. Uh, there are some qualitative and uh, anecdotal reports that indicating that enhanced prosocial behavior could be one of the post-traumatic growth outcomes. However, in the empirical research into such uh, issues are very, is very limited. Uh, well, we listed some examples here. Uh, most studies are cross-sectional. So the purpose of, of our study was to use the longitudinal data to examine the overall change in prosocial behavior and to identify the developmental trajectory of the prosocial behavior and also to examine the predictors of the uh, trajectory membership. Uh, the, so in this study, the uh, participants were from the cohort, uh, and we used the prosocial subscale from the SDQ to measure prosocial behavior. We also included the data from um, some variables in this study as uh, control variables. Uh, in the data analysis, we used the gross mixture modeling to identify different clusters of the prosocial behavior trajectories. And we also use the logistic regression um, to uh, examine the predictors that may be significantly related with the um, different trajectory of prosocial behavior. So uh, these are the results. As you can see, the average scores of prosocial behavior are kind of uh, similar at uh, the three waves, but the uh, standard deviation became bigger and bigger, which means the uh, individual variation became bigger and bigger. So we um, uh, used the um, growth uh, modeling to um, examine the different uh, trajectories. And we found out that uh, there are four different patterns of the uh, trajectory. Uh, about 35% uh, of the sample showed a high and enhancing trajectory, uh, which means they have a high initial level and showed an increasing tendency of their prosocial behaviors. And about 30% uh, showed a high stable trajectory, and about uh, the remaining 35% showed a low declining uh, patterns. Well, as for the uh, predictors of prosocial behavior, we found out that uh, female gender, uh, higher social support, and higher positive coping uh, were uh, significantly related with uh, the possibility belonging to the high enhancing group. Well, um, 
because we do not have the data uh, before the earthquake, so um, maybe some of you may w wondering if there's some possibility that the subjects in the high enhancing group may ha already have the tendency of in increase in prosocial behavior, even they uh, do not uh, experience the earthquake. So the results may be not related to the earthquake exposure. So in, in a discussion of this paper, we um, searched for the literature uh, regarding the age-related uh, prosocial behavior change during adolescence. Um, theoretically, uh, as uh, children uh, mature in social cognitive and affective uh, capacities, and as they have more and more socialization practices, their prosocial behavior may increase. But in the uh, empirical studies, um, most of the studies have failed to observe an age-related increase in prosocial behaviors, especially during adolescence. Well, most of these studies uh, reported that uh, there seems to be a stable or declining tendency in the prosocial behavior during adolescence. So in our study, we found uh, there are 35% of the sample showed uh, enhancing tendency. Uh, this may uh, provide an evidence for the altruism born of suffering. Um, I think uh, the other uh, important finding from this study is that we found uh, female gender, more social support, and great positive uh, coping were um, uh, well, uh, felicitate the enhancing, uh, high enhancing trajectory, which indicate the importance uh, for uh, pro providing the adolescents which exposed, uh, exposed to a disaster with more social support and coping training to facilitate the prosocial behavior enhancement. I think which maybe w uh, also help them to uh, develop the post-traumatic growth. Well, um, uh, that's that's uh, all for the study on the prosocial behavior. Um, at last, I want to talk a little about the genetic and the neural images sub-study, uh, as we are actually um, are doing right now. Uh, the uh, genetic sub-study uh, was conducted in uh, 2013, which is five years after the earthquake. Um, at this time point, most uh, participants from the original cohort has um, already um, graduated from the original schools, so it's kind of difficult to track them. Um, to ensure a large enough ample, uh, sample size, we conducted another screening uh, survey among uh, 3,500 adolescents. Um, and uh, through this survey, we identified some um, uh, about uh, 512 adolescents that may, may have and not have um, mental disorders. And then we interviewed each of them using the mini uh, international neuropsychiatric interview. And at last, we identified um, 117 adolescents uh, with diagnosed uh, anxiety disorders, and also 139 diagnosed with uh, depression. And we also identified um, 121 uh, as control group. and. Um, we collected the, the uh, oral mucosal samples from both the case and the control groups, and we will uh, use the um, oral mucosal samples for a genetic analysis. <laughs> and also, um, we are uh, currently uh, planning to um, do the neural image sub-study. And these are uh, some uh, results from the uh, uh, genetic data. <laughs> we found out that the um, some of the Local cortical and receptor gene polymorphisms may have an important role in anxiety disorders. Well, um, these uh, results are kind of uh, preliminary because uh, most of the genetic data are still uh, analyzing. Okay, uh, I think that's all for my presentation. And these are some important uh, papers we have published in English. So uh, if you are interested in our work and uh, want to know more details, you can uh, search for them. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the paper on prosocial behavior has uh, also just uh, accepted by the Journal of Traumatic Stress, and I think it will be online soon. So um, thank you. Let me ask you then this focus question. If you'd had the choice between studying 1,500 people where you did versus 750 people where you did and 750 in a Read part of such one that was close by, 
would you have gone for 1,575 where you had them, or would you have gone for 750 with a comparison group? Well, in the original research design, we, yeah, we wanted to collect some control group data, but it's you know, just difficult in reality, because, uh, especially in the earthquake areas. It's six months after the earthquake. It's kind of um, a little bit chaos. So to do research is uh, very difficult there. So it's well, kind without of Without a comparison group, yeah. we don't know if this has anything whatsoever to do with the earthquake, right? Yeah. We don't know whether we would have seen exactly the same trends yeah. had there been no earthquake. Yeah. What we, we can only do is control the earthquake exposure in the model, so. Yes, you could have done a yeah. dosage kind of study, yeah. thinking about it, um, and I don't know that particular control you use, but it is possible to do dosage kinds of studies to look at um, natural disasters and the consequences by proximity and things like this. From one uh, one area, one, one area. city, yeah. And they were all in the camp? Um, or I think in the early stage of the earthquake, most of the families are uh, were living in the camps. Uh -huh. So they uh, maybe some of them were uh, relocated, and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's also to the exposure that they must have had. You know? yeah. So you take that into consideration also, from where they came and the kind of yeah. exposure. And I, I don't know, I know how much, uh, you see about uh, the kind of uh, help and work is expected after uh, any kind of disaster. Generally, it's something that is, uh, um, you know, uh, put to this uh, uh, young people that they need to come to help, or is it something that comes spontaneously? Were these things also like variables in your study, or? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we, we measured the earthquake exposure um, there's one aspect that related to the house damage. As you can see, about, um, I think about 19% um, of them have um, moderate or severe house damage. So I think uh, the, well, uh, how do you say, um, most, uh, because we are not a professional uh, psychiatrist, yeah. we just do research, so yeah. it's, Kind of difficult to provide directly the um, service for the adolescents, but um, during our research process, uh, if we ad uh, if we identified someone with severe problems, we, we refer them to professionals. Yeah, yeah. that's what we want. Yeah, this is a very um, interesting research, and this is something that we could also think of taking it up in our mm -hmm. country. And probably it's helpful also uh, me to say that because would that make a difference? Because in in our Nepal uh, company, context, it was like, you know, we were in different uh, um, in the places after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of them were in camps. We, we were out of our houses. For me, for my own experience, out of, I was out of my house for almost three months. Uh, but we were very much in our own neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with a family, cousins, or in the neighbors, and in, in tents. But then, of course, for people who could not afford, they were uh, you know, sheltered by the government. So you know, how you take the data, who was offering uh, what, and how they were involving themselves would make a huge difference. I mean, that's what I was trying to say. You know? yeah. Was it more spontaneous? So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that the living circumstances of the camp experience may have been a confounding variable yes. other yes. than the yeah, quite yes. experience. Something, and something that comes in, uh, probably from the country or the culture where things are expected out of you, where you think you know, the young are called for help, I don't know how it was in, the, in her research, sure, where so. that was expected that, you know, that was, you know, uh, more so something that was reinforced by the government or something like that, because in our context also, so often it was. Yeah. Sure. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you for the <laughs> thank you. great uh, study. It takes a lot of effort. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, also, it gives us a a paradigm of psychosocial. You already analyzed the uh, psychological and so, so, uh, social, but also try to figure out about the uh, biological thing. Mm -hmm. But I think there are uh, missing link here in your biological explanation because polymorphism in genetics didn't tell us anything if we could not do 
the study of prote protein expression because genetic code only give us a receipt of some, some kind of protein but after that it will be a post-translation modification and the methylation and it will change the protein expression if you find out the glucocorticoid it might be related to cortisol and anxiety it might be better if you could add more stages of research yes. which explore the protein expression and related to the cortisol and the anxiety symptom in your patient just my suggestion Thank yes uh, i know <laughs> that's uh, also kind of a limitation here because um we want you to collect the blood sample for the for analy uh, analyzing the protein methylation or acetylation. Uh, that is the uh, epigenetic study would do, but it's kind of difficult to, because some of the parents did, didn't want their children to give their blood, so we, <laughs> we, only, we only can collect the oral mucosal sample. So, so our, our genetic data, what we can only do is to genetic the vulnerability, vulnerability genes, so it's not epigenetic. The main point I want to make is that disaster studies um, almost by definition don't have pretest measures. Right? Now, <clears throat> I don't know China at all, but for these 1,500 people, um, do you have prior information about the school performance of children on tests? Yes. Do you have information about the medical records you can get access to? If you have this kind of information, and uh, I don't know if you collected it, but if it's available, that's sometimes very useful for constructing proxy pretest series mm -hmm. for these children. Mm -hmm. Right? So things that are correlated with the outcomes that you directly measure, for which you have a little time series beforehand in educational data, in health data, in demographic data, or whatever. So the fact that it's a post-test only design does not require it to be a post-test only design. Yes, well, we collected the uh, school performance data using the school test records, but the medical records, it, it, because the medical system is, is not that um, complete in China, so yes. yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, any particular reason to, uh, like for the case, you have taken one standard deviation from the Z score, oh. but for the control you have taken 1.5 standard yes. deviation. Any particular reason for the discrepancy? Yes, because we uh, searched the, the literature and um, many uh, studies show that there's kind of um tendency for the uh, people to exaggerate their own symptoms when they uh, report it by themselves. So. We use a, a little bit higher standard deviation and below the average. Taking a lower standard deviation, no one is D. Yeah, for the control group, for the control group, potential control group, we use a little bit higher standard deviation above the average. Okay. Use the this criteria. So, mm, I yeah. don't know, like whether we can go for two standard deviation, two type mm -hmm. of standard deviation for different groups. Yeah. Because for one group we are going for specificity, for another group we are going for sensitivity. Yeah, uh, like what I, I just said, um, we looked in the literature, uh, many studies said that um, the people tend to exaggerate their own symptoms, so we use a um, higher <laughs> standard for the potential control group. Mm. So, to fund this study, a lot of other things that were meritorious would not have been funded. So my question to you is um, about the strategy of funding many small studies versus one or two bigger studies. Do you want to say anything about the politics of science in this respect? In the uh, funds, what we have got? No, I'm not asking you for the money. <laughs> I know the money from Bang Bang last year. Yes. But I'm asking you the, this question about policy for science. Is it better to fund many small studies or to fund one very big study like this? Because it could have been 10 little studies yes. as opposed to one big study. Yeah, um, our, our major sources of uh, funding are, are these two fundings. But we are uh, also able to get some small, small fundings. Yeah, recently, I, I myself just got a postdoc research funding. 
So it's also related to this research project. So what about if we, because I think that's quite an important question, what about if we throw that out to the floor? What do, what do you think? Is it better to concentrate the resources into one or mm -hmm. two big studies, or do you split that up into a smaller number of studies? Mm -hmm. Under what conditions might you want to make different choices? Is it? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a difficult question as such, uh, but uh, to me, I think uh, it's better to have a small, um, like, studies and distribute funding in the, like in several sub studies instead of having uh, a big fund, a big, big study and big funding uh, and on what basis do you make that judgment mm -hmm. sorry uh, and how, why do you say that uh, because see uh, if you are distributing a study uh, there will be like uh, kind of heterogeneous information you can delve into uh, detail uh, in case of like uh, big funding, sometimes we miss uh, small things. Uh, apart from that, logistic uh, uh, logistic uh, perspective, uh, you, are, you are training a large number of researchers at the same time. Okay, so you've got a capacity building. Yeah, capacity yeah. building, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But our research group is also very big. Very yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Many uh, post uh, postdoc and a doctor student or a PhD uh, or a master student, they can have the uh, opportunity to get practiced. Yeah. Any other views? Uh, for me, uh, getting uh, from my experience in Indonesia related to disaster is uh, still few studies, so we don't have much baseline studies, so we would go for to the small funding, but then the evidence will be accumulated, then we can uh, we can know which which big project which we can aim. So for you, it's part of a process, it's part of a program of, of research. Tom, do you have any views on, on which do you think is... Uh, I have views that are very general, but are not locally embedded, mm -hmm. but they may not be worth that. Okay, I was then. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.